Welcome to Managing Venous Thromboembolism in Hospitalized Patients, Considerations for the Use of Novel Oral Anticoagulants, presented by the Penn State College of Medicine. My name is Dr. Sam Goldhaber, and I'm Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Thrombosis Research Group at Brigham and Women's Hospital. I'm pleased to serve as Activity Director for this important educational symposium. Activities on Cardio Care Live are interactive, allowing us to take your questions in real time throughout this presentation. We encourage you to enter questions at any time in the box located at the lower left-hand side of your screen. Joining me today in today's discussion is Dr. Christian Ruff, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Associate Physician in the Cardiovascular Medicine Division at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Christian, thank you for joining us today. I'm now going to hand the presentation over to you to begin our discussion. Thank you, Sam. It's a real pleasure to be with you today and deal with an incredibly important topic in our healthcare society and that's managing venous thromboembolism in hospitalized patients. And today we're really going to focus and concentrate on the role of these new or novel oral anticoagulants, which we like to call NOACs. These are my relevant disclosures. Importantly, I've received research support or consulting for Bollinger Engelheim, Daiichi Sankyo, and Bristol Myers Squibb, who are all sponsors of some of the drugs that have been studied and approved for this indication. We have three learning objectives today. First is to evaluate the use of NOACs to treat hospitalized patients with venous thromboembolism. Two, and I think this is really critical, is how do we assess risk of recurrent VTE? And this is something I think we all struggle with clinically. And then finally, to select and initiate the appropriate anticoagulant strategy for patients at risk for recurrent venous thromboembolism. So let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology and the pathophysiology that really underlie this disorder and how we treat it. So this is unfortunately something, Sam, that you and I see very frequently, fatal saddle pulmonary embolism. So this bolt out of this blue, a massive clot in the pulmonary arteries, which can lead to mortality, but also incredible morbidity. And unfortunately, pulmonary embolism and fatal pulmonary embolism is very common. Almost 180, close to 200,000 deaths per year in the U.S. alone. And it remains the most preventable cause of death among hospitalized patients. So this is really on the forefront of anybody who takes care of patients admitted to the hospital. And as we've learned from the most contemporary registries, and this is coming out of Italy, the IPER registry, we know that patients with pulmonary embolism have a very high in-hospital mortality, particularly patients with massive pulmonary embolism, and we'll define that in a minute. But mortality can reach approximately a third in hospital for very serious pulmonary embolism. So these patients are certainly at very high risk early on in the course of their treatment. The AHA has released relatively recent guidelines several years ago defining the risk spectrum of pulmonary embolism. We know that approximately 5 to 10 percent of patients have massive pulmonary embolism. These are the, the worst types of PE you can have. The definition is sustained hypotension, so a low blood pressure, pulselessness, or a persistent uh, tachycardia. Submassive pulmonary embolism, which is about a fifth to a quarter of patients, they have RV dysfunction or myocardial necrosis. Usually that's measured with a biomarker such as troponin, but they don't have hypotension. So hemodynamically, they're relatively stable. And then there's a large percentage of patients who are relatively low risk, approximately 70% of patients, and they have no markers of adverse prognosis, whether that's clinical markers or biomarkers such as troponin. But even if patients survive a pulmonary embolism, uh, there are, we know that these clots often come from the leg, these deep venous thrombosis. And even in patients who don't even have a PE, DVT can be incredibly problematic for these patients because there is substantial morbidity. Approximately 25, maybe up to 40% of patients who have a DVT can have really a range of complications that are from venous ectasia or vein abnormality, some swelling in the leg, discoloration, all the way to frank ulcers. And once you have these complications of DVT, they're very chronic and they last for years and are very difficult to treat. Yeah, and I'm so glad you bring that up because I think 
we tend to put this into a silo of survivors and non-survivors. Exactly. And, and if you're stable, you're very likely to survive an initial pulmonary embolism. And the mortality rate from post-phlebitic syndrome or post-thrombotic syndrome is zero, yet the illness really has a major impact, negative impact in people's lives. Uh, and similarly, exactly. chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, uh, that can be a devastating lifelong illness that persists. So I, I'm so glad you're really highlighting uh, for our participants that there can be a lot of serious problem that occurs even with survival right. from the initial pulmonary embolism. No, Sam, that's an excellent point. And I think what we learn is that once you have one of these conditions, mm -hmm. post-thrombotic syndrome or chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, they're very difficult to treat. Mm -hmm. And so we're much better off preventing it in the first place right. because our therapies to decrease the symptom burden, unfortunately, are inadequate. I mean, with post-thrombotic syndrome, just think of the time lost from work. And also, people tend to enclose themselves in their, their own apartments or houses and not socialize because it hurts them when they stand up or they're embarrassed uh, the way their ankles look uh, because of some of these permanent changes that occur. Exactly. So this can await many of these patients even when they get out of the hospital. And we can't lose sight of that when we follow these patients in our clinics. And what we're learning is that, you know, we focus a lot of our attention on patients who have myocardial infarction and stroke. Uh, and then we think, well, there's a different subset of patients who are having venous thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism. But what we realize is they're the same patients. And whether you have a clot on the venous system or the arterial system, it's the same underlying process. The very same risk factors that we think about for heart attacks, whether obesity, hypertension, high cholesterol, smoking, tobacco, diabetes, all of these things predispose to clots and thrombosis throughout the vascular bed, whether you're on the veins or the arterial side. And we know underlying this process of clotting and thrombosis is low level inflammation, coagulability, and damage to the lining of our blood vessels. And so many of the therapies that we're gonna talk about today both prevent clots on the venous as well as arterial system. They're the same patients, Sam. Well, I think you're making a very important point. In the olden days, uh, we were all taught that you have red clot, which is right. from venous thromboembolism, and white clot, which is myocardial infarction and, and stroke. And now the new epidemiology and the new pathophysiology are telling us that this is all part of a vascular disease syndrome with very similar risk factors and very similar pathophysiology. And we can't silo this any further. In addition, if you have a pulmonary embolism or DVT during the rest of your life, you're about two or three times more likely to suffer myocardial infarction and stroke. And if you have an MI or a stroke uh, during the rest of your life, you're about two to three times more likely than others to suffer pulmonary embolism and DVT. So these are all integrated and intermeshed, and the era of the siloing is over. And I think that's, we really have to emphasize taking care of the patient and not just the disease state because there's such tremendous overlap. And I think this really bears to brunt of how we understand the pathophysiology because underlying clotting and heart attack, stroke, and VTE is really inflammation. And we know that the body's immune system, which is very effective at preventing infections or malignancy, unfortunately, if you have elevated inflammation chronically, that can predispose to clotting, and it can predispose to venous thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism. And we've had some very exciting research to come out of this field, and this is just an illustrative example out of the Jupiter trial, and these were healthy patients who were given a statin to prevent a heart attack because they had elevated levels of a marker in the blood, CRP, that was high. So they had high chronic inflammation, but otherwise would not have qualified for statin therapy. And in this trial, uh, they showed an overwhelming reduction in preventing heart attacks and cardiovascular.